My name is Nick Drazio, Director of Corporate Strategy at Invent Global, and I am joined by my trusty co-host, Eric Gendel. Hey, Eric, how are you doing? What's up, everybody? How's it going, Nick? Man, honestly, things have been things have been fun. I've I feel as if for the last week I was having some quarantine blues, you know. Okay. Yeah. Um, it actually all started with Super Smash Brothers, believe it or not. Um, I have wait game... for things getting better. Or for no, for things getting worse. No, for things getting worse. I know this sounds strange, but um, uh, we yeah, actually you know what? Here, I'll tell that story later. Um, <laughs> I'll. I'll tell the story later. First of all, okay. I, I just want to thank you all for um, listening, and I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, um, HyperX. Uh, I am wearing HyperX um, headphones right now. I have this awesome HyperX uh, a microphone. This is their quad core. It's so cool. I can mute myself with just a tap of a button, and I love it. It has saved me so many times. First of all, thank you so much, HyperX. You make this podcast possible. Now, yeah. on to the depressing news about how Super Smash Bros. made me sad. <laughs> So I have my GameCube and I haven't been able to play it because I don't have a monitor that I can like plug it in here, right? Because I wasn't like aware that I would be indoors so much. But yeah. for my birthday, my dad, as a gift, sent me this adapter. So I was able to play this GameCube game on my modern a monitor with no lag. Dope, right? So I start playing Super Smash Brothers a Melee on my GameCube and I just literally, I start practicing a tech skill. It's so much fun. I'm like for an hour, I'm just sitting there enjoying it. And it really hits me that like, I haven't been to a Smash Brothers event in like weeks, actually maybe like a month that I'm not going to be able to go to a Smash Brothers event for a long time. And it just really made me sad. Like I've, I miss my weeklies. I miss all my Smash friends. And I just miss the feeling of like playing games with strangers and meeting them. And like, you know, that really cool moment where you don't, like know someone you don't know if they're good or not and you play and then oh it's fun because you're both really good so now you have this cool set and it just got me really down you know i'm like dang it really hit me but yeah i mean th these past couple of weeks have just gone by so quickly yeah. like i don't know what it is i think it's just like the repetition like yep. doing the same thing that i've been doing for the past like month now yeah right um, I mean, I, I start up with Animal Crossing at 8, I play from 8 to 9, uh -huh. and then I go to work, I eat lunch at the same exact time, and then I get off of work at the same exact time, and I've just been playing, like, Persona 5 Royal, uh, like, non-stop after uh, I get off of work. That's uh, pretty great could, that you have, like, a gaming schedule, though. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, uh, like, if Final Fantasy VII came out, and I thought I was going to play that all weekend, but uh, no... Persona 5 Royal. I mean, it's basically like a game that I've already put 120 mm -hmm. hours into. Yeah. Uh, and now I'm looking into putting like 150 hours into this game because of all the stuff that they had and stuff. And just like. Man, so I, I think it's that's pretty interesting. You're choosing this game over Final Fantasy 7? Yeah, I don't know what it is. Uh, Persona 5 Royal is just so safe. I, yeah, I know what like, to expect uh, until I don't know what to expect with all the new stuff that they added. Uh, uh, like, you know, I, I played the original when it came out in 2017. So uh, trying to figure out, you know, oh, is this new? Is this not new? Yeah. Uh, they changed like all the battle mechanics. They've added all these like new social confidants and stuff in. It's super good. That's uh, fun. Yeah. Yeah. My, my girlfriend's been watching me play it. Uh, she's getting into it. She's got her favorite characters and stuff. So you know it's what? nice. I and I I will say the silver lining of, of all of this is my wife is becoming a gamer and she doesn't call herself that but I swear to God she is she's been playing the Animal Crossing version on her phone you know the little Animal Crossing I think it's called like a camp yeah, away, something. Uh, po pocket camp yes pocket something. camp oh yeah. my God she's so into it like it's incredible and I'm it actually I had a, a realization about the Animal I'm crossing game and why it brings in such a diverse group of gamers. Mm -hmm. She literally gets to like, you know, cause she's a very fashionable a woman. She loves design. She yeah. loves, you know, dressing well. She's worked in fashion, but like this quarantine, she can't like plan outfits. She doesn't like wear nice clothes. She just wears the same pajamas every day as we all do. Right. So literally in this game, every day, her animal crossing character has a new outfit every day she like redecorates her cool cabin and everything so like she's like actively getting that out and it kind of reminds me of 
The Sims. If you like, remember in the original Sims when that came out, yeah. there was this this influx of gamers who were from a very very um, diverse background. These are people that you wouldn't nearly consider gamers, but all of a sudden they flocked to Sims, and that was their first game. So I feel like Animal Crossing is doing the same thing, and it's cool to see that. Yeah, I'm basically doing like my Animal Crossing dailies now, where I just mm -hmm. like dig up my fossils and get them assessed and check on my money trees and my fruits and stuff. But I've gotten up to this point where I've unlocked the uh, terraforming tools and stuff, so you can actually you put down paths and, and uh -huh. stone paths and all you can uh, make like rivers and get rid of your mountains and hills and stuff if you That's want fun. to but every time that i look at it i'm like planning stuff out it's just it's so much it's overwhelming <laughs> sometimes where you're just like oh what the fuck because well, like i'm gonna have to move all these houses around that's gonna take like you can move like a house per day so uh -huh. it's gonna take all that you can't really do anything in the meantime uh, -huh. uh and all that stuff costs so much money, like building bridges and building inclines, like hundreds of thousands of bells and stuff. And it's just like, The man. bell um, economy is strong. By the way... But I, I see some of these villages and stuff, and I'm like, damn, you must have put like like hundreds of hours in this game already. It's like, it's, it's nuts. Wow. By the way, speaking yeah. of nuts, moving on to, I guess, our first topic of yeah, the day. Yeah. And by the way, I absolutely love this um, headline shout outs to a blizzardwatch.com the new hero i'm um, overwatch right so echo has come out she's a cyborg lady she has some pretty cool emotes i think yeah. i love like the vibe check one where she essentially like scans it's just cool right so like aesthetically yeah. per the usual um, overwatch heroes are dope like aesthetically yeah, it's all there but a lot of people don't like don't like the design. So, Eric, have you had a chance to really dive into this hero? I actually haven't, but reading through this article made me want to jump in. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done it for, you know, I'm not super into Overwatch anymore, but I've, at the very least, you know, hopped into training mode just to yep. try everybody out. Um, yeah, I don't know. She seems, uh, she seems really cool, but also, like, super broken at yeah. the same time. I don't know. Uh, I mean, this article is a really good read, actually. They kind of you know, throw their own two cents out there. But, uh, you know, they've been kind of uh, looking into the the past couple of heroes that have come out yeah. uh, and how they're basically uh, good at everything. Yeah. So if you're good at everything, uh, this the character will just, like, completely kill, which is, you know, it's fun for the, uh, the pro, you know, scene and everything, but for casuals and everything, it could just kind of be a bit overwhelming. So, uh, yeah, and... I think that you really uh, nailed it on the head here um, when you're saying that, like, if you're good at the game, you're probably going to have a lot of fun, like, stopping people. But yeah. um, Overwatch's biggest problem and still consistently is when you lose, oh, does it feel horrible? You're getting stomped. You can't it do really anything. Yeah. It feels horrible. <laughs> and, and when you win, it feels like random. And this is when you're just playing as a normal casual player, right? I've always said, and I will stand by this, Overwatch is most fun when you're playing with a full stack of friends and you're not trying to win. That's it. Full stack of friends, not I'm trying to win. You're more trying to, to socialize. That's when it's at its most fun. But, yeah, but Echo <laughs> is just another one of these heroes that can dominate the game and can do so in a way that just seems like... Yeah. How, like, like, how are you supposed to play like McCree, a hero who is stuck on his two feet with a little pistol and he rolls a bit. And this hero can fly, do tons of damage. No, I mean, she can what turn I've been in is to like, other heroes. It's like the power creep is she so completely, big. She completely invalidates like choosing Farah as a, as a hero, yeah. like at all. Yeah. Um, with the amount of damage that they're dealing, uh, you know, she deals like... Maybe it's not double damage, but it's significantly more damage to heroes that have, like, less than uh, half health. But yeah. that also applies to shields that have, like, half health left. Yeah, um, yeah I don't know. Uh, and, I mean, you're always saying it, you know. Uh, Overwatch is rooted in this very core idea that Jeff Kaplan originally had where yes. you're choosing, you know, multiple heroes. You can have multiple hero of the same heroes on the field. I, yes, uh, oh my God. Because but they were also, like, very simple uh, in their execution. They all had very definitive roles. You know, yes. Widowmaker was the sniper. Uh, you know, Tracer is DPS. Now you I'm know, all the tanks. Uh, right now. I'm going to say right now, okay? Overwatch esports ruined Overwatch for me, like the game. Because before yeah. Overwatch um, esports, you could have a 
nutty fun time with your friends all pick Winston and it was hilarious like literally you're all playing Winston and you're it's you're just monkeying around and then you know like yeah. naturally the team says oh, okay we're like against all these monkeys so they all pick you know counter heroes you're now up against like four reapers and two bastions right that's fun right like that stuff to me like embrace and again the core game was designed around this but i think one of the things that i think is most interesting and as as heroes of the storm fans and i'm not sure how long you've been playing heroes of the storm but there's a hero in that game called uh, um, Abathur, right? And Abathur yeah. has always had the um, ability in which you can transform into another hero on your team uh, temporarily, just like this hero, right? It's the same ability. But here's the thing. When the game first launched, when you transformed into the other hero, you could use their ultimate ability too. And it was busted. It was so busted. Yeah. Everyone knew from the get-go it was busted because it inherently makes... Her, it made Aberthur so, so powerful because you could now choose between four different ultimates whenever you needed to. Oh, if I need this, then I just, you know, transform into this hero and bam. Or like, yeah. or, you know, say, for example, in the case of Overwatch, you have a hero like Genji whose ultimate is very, very game breaking. It's very powerful, but it, like it's hard to get because you need to be doing well with Genji, who is inherently a fragile hero. Well, if you play as Echo, you just get your ultimate, and now you can have two um, Genji blades going on at the same time. It's just nuts. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's way too much. It's and nuts. I, yeah, I saw uh, I saw a clip uh, going around that was like uh, pro streamers playing like Reinhardt, or he was playing um, Echo, but he turned into Reinhardt. He got his uh, ultimate like two times within the. Uh, yeah. the that charge that that copy went through i was like Jeez, yeah. so, so so you know i think too with overwatch and by the way i can't believe they're up to 32 heroes i actually thought it was yeah. a typo in our show notes <laughs> when it yeah. said 30 was said the 30 second hero i'm like oh yeah i guess there is a lot because it doesn't like feel like there's 32 heroes it feels yeah. like there's like there's like nine heroes that kill everyone and then there's like <laughs> you know there's what a 22 heroes or 23 well i can't do math so well, that's actually something else that I want to talk about is yeah. apparently this is the last character that they're adding into Overwatch 1 until Overwatch 2. Really? You yeah. Mean so, Overwatch 2. If you're yeah, not Overwatch seeing two. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not seeing the visual form of this podcast, which you can watch at twitch.tv slash Global or on our YouTube in which we like upload all of the abods of this, Overwatch heavy quotation marks 2 is the sequel to Overwatch, which I think is essentially a big patch. Like, it's essentially a big patch you're paying for. It. Yeah, like, yeah. How much exactly are you going to change? So uh, I was thinking, like, if that's the case, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, is Overwatch 2 going to be coming out later this year? Is that... I mean, we've got uh, eight months left in the year, right? I mean, are we going to be going that long without another hero being I introduced mean, in the game? I mean, uh, later in the podcast we're going to be talking about what riot's doing and their new games so i hope blizzard has more things to launch just something i hope right? it has something in you know i think um this actually like you know like now that we're talking uh, about overwatch and as you guys know me and eric work in the esports industry i'm um, in global is constantly trying to figure out ways in which we can you know bring the best esports content to our audiences right in that quest we often have to assess the health of an esports league, right? We actually use to cover Overwatch all the time. We used to put tons of resources in covering the Overwatch League and using our own internal just metrics, I mean, we were able to see this super spike when Overwatch League Season 1 came out, right? And man, it was great. You would write about Overwatch League, so many views. Oh, it was so yeah. easy. It was so great. And it was just steadily in the decline, steadily like in the decline. And... I've talked to some of my peers for other esports sites and other content creators, especially streamers, and they all say the same thing, right? That like Overwatch just stopped being something gamers cared about. And I think with the release of uh, Valorant, I think there's now more than ever, you start understanding Overwatch's problems because after you play a game like Valorant, you're like, oh, <laughs> FPS is about aim and positioning and like you know like lethality and i think so many 
and we've talked about this a lot on the podcast, but it's even more like relevant now because more people are getting drops. By the way, uh, shout outs to Riot. Very, very smart decision to get rid of all of that drama surrounding the, the drops on Twitch and just decide to say, no, everyone gets a drop, which I think is very, very smart. But, yeah. Do you just want to jump into? Yeah, Dalton yeah, and yeah, yeah. Stuff? So, so you know, as we go on, now you can see we're going to be covering some of this Valorant news. Um, they've announced their esports plans, and I think it's the perfect time for it because yeah. all of those Overwatch fans who now have drops, it's it's no longer a closed. I mean, yes, it's closed, but come on, they're giving the like beta keys to everyone. Um, more and more people are playing Valorant, and they're like falling in love with it. Like I see it all over my Twitter. I see it over um, social media. I just see more and more people falling in love with the character designs of Valorant. And I think too, it's something you can like aspire to. Like people want to get good at a Valorant. And also, maybe this is reading too much into it, but whenever I talk to a friend about Valorant, or you know, I, I'm actually planning on playing Valorant later today with an old friend of mine, one of the first things we talked about is like, you know, like, how good are you? Or like, you know, like, what's your skill level at? Like, you know, like, how should we play that? And that's just not what people talk about with like Overwatch anymore. Like, I feel as if people really want to get good at Valorant. And I think it's the gameplay 100%. The gameplay just rewards a discipline. And I don't think Overwatch has done for a long time. So that being said, Eric. So Eric, yeah. yeah. Uh, Valorant Esports. What do you think? I mean, yeah, everything that they kind of laid out is is pretty standard fare, I think. Uh, you know, they just said, oh, yeah, we have uh, plans for esports. And, I mean, that's basically it. They're really doling everything out. They said that they're, they've talked to over, like, 100 esports teams now. They're getting, like, uh, you know, different viewpoints on, you know, what these teams want to see out of the league, what they can, uh, you know, yeah. uh, improve on. Uh, you know, it's all pretty much, like, stuff that you would assume that they have in the works already and i think um, part yeah and yeah. part of that assumption i think that is so nice is because when you have a game like this come out in the beta we, you start seeing um community uh, tournaments right you start seeing community support there was already tons of community tournaments that we covered on inventglobal.com there was the juked um um, open in which we sponsored that was super cool a uh, shout outs to golden boy did a fantastic job casting that some really awesome games and, and there was also the first ever all female a uh, valorant um open cup which was awesome shout outs to miss harvey for doing that you can read about all these stuff on our site but unlike the overwatch league and unlike uh a Fortnite, a uh, valorant is taking an old school um, approach to this in a press release that they sent to um, MN Global and I'm sure every other esports media um, outlet, they made it very clear that right now all they're trying to do is assist third party tournament organizers. And I love it. I'm happy to hear that they're not trying to force Valorant to be this esport. They're not trying to be like, yeah, we're going to have $20 million buy ins and this, this, and that. We're going to have, I mean, obviously they really can't do that in like COVID 19 situation, but I think it's very, very smart. Eric, what experience do you have in terms of like watching an esport that's a community cup versus one that's maybe more developer centric? Like, is there any one that you prefer? You know, like, how do you think this is going to play out for Valorant? I think the community stuff uh, is definitely more entertaining. Uh, you know, it's usually kind of run by the fans. Yep. You know, it's run by the community, like the, the name implies. Um, you know, the bigger stuff is, is fun. You usually see, like, the best of the best in there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, both have its merits. Uh, personally, I probably uh, enjoy the community stuff a bit better. So, Wow. And you know what? There are also two. I'm clicking through some of this article now. And first of all, I will agree with you that they're way more um, entertaining. One of my favorite parts about the Golden Boy a cast that I mentioned during the Juke tournament is, you know, he was free to say whatever he – you know, like whatever he wanted to. That's my favorite part about esports. You know, give casters the like ability to just pop off at hype moments. Like I love that. Um, but they're also yeah. um, opening up the API to um, anyone interested in creating tools around yeah. the Valorant, which, by the way, is going to be awesome. If any one of you is familiar with CS:GO, um, so much of why that game is such a clean and awesome esport to watch is because the community has, for years and years, been making tools that help understand the game through stats that help understand the game as 
a viewer. There's so many cool things that people have done. And now it's just standard. Now it's like, you know, Valve has embraced all of that. And now it's just part of the thing. But it wasn't always like that. It like required these developers to be open with their API and to be supporting third party um, tournament organizers. So another hats off to Riot. I swear this isn't the Riot podcast. But when you're talking about esports news, I mean, there's really no one who's doing it better right now. Um, yeah, it's the hottest pre esport right now. Yeah. So, however, <laughs> I will say, I will say that all is not absolutely perfect in the land of a Valorant. Um, yeah, so we're we're like two weeks after the launch, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, so you've been playing a bit more. What do you What do you think? I have, have been. I do you like it more? Do you like it less? Are so, you trying? Are you starting to see some like? places where they can improve on things oh yeah so now okay new segment called nick's valorant rants starting right now <laughs> you've heard it um, um episode 12 is the birthday of nick valorant rants um yeah they really need to get rid of some of the um abilities in this game uh i quote yeah. this often when i'm trying to like talk about why i think purity of vision is so important but it's a breaking bad quote no half measures all right you cannot take yeah. half measures when it comes to trying to design a game because if you if there's ever something we've learned about the esports titles and the competitive titles that go the distance, I'm talking the games that have you know 10 year runs, uh, 15 year runs that are still playing now. It's because there is a purity of vision, and I think Valorant is its absolute uh, weakest when you can't tell is this a tactic based shooter yeah. or is I mean, it a MOBA. I I think we talked about it last week, but yeah. like I was a bit more, you know, uh, critical about it. You you seemed to be having a better time than I was, and it came down to, you know, you you said that a lot of the abilities, um, they're not really damage based. It's more about like evasion and you know helping out your teammates, whether it's and like heals it or, or putting down like areas. And I of take it back. That, I've learned a bit more about the game. <laughs> I've played the game a lot more um actually i'm trying to find the tweet right now uh let me see if i can find it it was a summit 1g put it yeah nicely which by the way um i'm summit 1g summit 1g is like obviously a huge voice in gaming if you don't know i'm on it right now he's like just an absolute a monster when it comes to his like engagement i'm pretty sure he's been like the top valorant streamer for some time now um yeah. but he has some pretty pretty great points about certain heroes uh raise for one and i know this is a sentiment it's practically a meme now that's pretty much shared by everyone i'm sure valorant I, i'm i'm sure the devs i already know that raise is busted right but, the the rocket yes but here's but here's my my issue right like i'm trying to find this tweet yeah 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 so you know here is summit summit once again you know complaining about raise complaining about the rockets you yeah. know all this stuff but like here's the thing the fact that the rockets and all of the explosions were even in the game in the first place it worries me because it shows that like you're taking half measures like may like why would you put one shot like uh, a <laughs> one shot kill ultimates you know how bad it feels to have three members of your team get wiped out because a raise just you know blind fired a rocket into the hookah lounge area of that you know one map which is which is a very popular place to push in it's like all right i guess we lose and it's like, because they got so many kills, they now get more points towards their ultimate. It's like nuts. Actually, I'm not exactly sure if it works like that. Someone can maybe correct me. If you get kills with your ultimate, you, you maybe don't get points towards the next ultimate. But I think that I really, really hope this next patch, and they did say that I believe it's going to be closed soon for like maintenance and for a bunch of like updates. I really, really hope that like this is a very important moment for valorance like for the community's uh, perception around this game because it's the hype is already a uh, wearing off you already have people um like summit 1g uh saying that eh, it's good but i don't think it'll top csgo which is not what they were saying when the game first came out uh i will have a little bit of i told you so because if you read through my tweets i called this i called that in two weeks, all this glowing praise of a Valorant, maybe it's going to be walked back a bit. But personally, I think that there's 
some abilities that they should just get rid of. I hate that arrow dude who has an ability that can shoot giant uh, lasers that go through the entire map and kill you in like one hit. It's like, what's going on here? How yeah. can you compare that with you know someone else's ultimate that like, for example, I play as Cypher because I think he's fun. His ultimate is what all the ultimates should be like. It's just a little perk in which you can briefly see where everyone is on the map. That's it. You still have to aim. You still have to shoot their heads. But you just get a little brief advantage because you get to see where everyone is. Meanwhile, yeah. like other heroes can just like you know blow you away. So I don't know. If you disagree, if you think that the reason Valorant's getting so much hype is because it is kind of breaking the rules with CSGO and it is, you know, like let me know at Nick Terrazio 3 or D, but I'm pretty yeah. fed up with it and I and I know there's, a lot of people are too. There's plenty of stuff like in the game that people are kind of picking apart. Uh, yeah. you know, obviously closed beta, they're gonna be making changes and stuff based off of all this feedback. But aside from that, I mean, have you heard of all this like anti cheat like program stuff that they're running in the in yeah. the background? Yeah, so that too, uh here it is. So this is an interesting thing. Um, yeah. Riot, um, uh, so this is an article by Amkotaku, uh, so shout out to them for this. But there was also tons of, you know, um, uh, murmurs around it on social media. There's also a really great YouTube video, and the guy, like, explained the whole thing. But Riot is very, very confident in its anti-cheat, right? If anything, that was one of the big things that it led with um, when yeah. it was in its big PR thing and when they first announced the game. So for those who aren't familiar, CSGO is fit filled with cheaters like filled with cheaters there's so many hacks for csgo and you know that's because the game's been around for so long and because it's pretty easy to cheat in csgo because the balance is so fine-tuned if you get even the slightest advantage the whole game is you know thrown away if i even can see where you are a little bit then there you go i can uh, rise up the ranks and because there's so much money in the esports scene sometimes very very gifted players feel the need to okay well what if i just cheat a little bit to grind through there's a whole yeah it's so obviously Riot wants to, you know, squash that before it's a major problem, but uh, yes. I feel like they've kind of gone overboard with the stuff that they, they've been implementing here. Where yeah, it's, and this quote, oh, yeah. so yeah. this quote, I think sums it up. This is one of the Redditors who said, you have a piece of software that cannot be, that cannot be a, a turned off, runs with elevated uh, privileges nonstop on your system. That is the anti-cheat. Other words, it's, it's yeah. a rootkit. Uh, you can do a, a Google search for that. I know that I had to. But essentially, the only way in which Riot can ensure that no one is cheating is that whenever you um, download the game, that's also what you're downloading. Now, Eric, before we get into like the nitty ditty, the um, nitty gritty, <laughs> nitty ditty, I like the nitty, the nitty ditty, the nitty ditty Kong uh, details about this, the big Donkey Kong uh, details. What do you know? about rootkits and hacking and all this not a whole lot okay uh, <laughs> so so i'll be the expert here because i yeah. watched a youtube video all right so ah, you've heard it here okay. first i'm um, in global is your number one source for experts after watching one youtube video <laughs> so from my understanding the reason why this is so so dangerous is because this rootkit has has access to some pretty core and very important things about your PC. And while yes, it is a, it's not like, Riot isn't trying to hack you. If you install this rootkit and you trust Riot, well, that's fine. Nothing bad is gonna happen. But here's the thing. What, what happens if some hacker or if someone finds a way to compromise it, right? What happens if someone finds a way to compromise this rootkit? And I'm talking all the way to like the level of who knows, maybe someone uh, infiltrates Riot's headquarters and finds a job, but it's this super deep operation in which it's yeah. like this like sleeper agent who's, you know, finds a job and he's in there for years. Then he finally gets on the team in which he's the person, you know, like he or she is the one that is writing the code for like the next patch. And, you know, there you go. They like hit, you know, they hit enter, the patch goes live, and then bam, you update your, like, a Valorant game. And all of a sudden, that rootkit that has so much control, so much permission, so much authority, is now something that's dangerous. Like, that now exists. You are 100% without fail by playing Valorant, you are exposing yourself to risk. Now, it's a risk that isn't present yet, and it's a risk that a lot of people 
are poo-pooing. But, like, I don't know. Maybe I don't want to do that. And so I don't know. <laughs> I think it's like... It's it's basically like a riot saying, you know, trust us. We've tested this thing. It's impenetrable. But, mm. I mean, of course they would say that. Yeah, uh, right. And I think it's also ridiculous that, like, this one game, you know, uh, it doesn't matter how casual or hardcore you are. Uh, it's just going to have so much control over your computer regardless. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, I get that, you know, a lot of these other uh, anti-cheat programs can be, you know, easily uh, exploitable because they mm -hmm. don't do this. But, I mean, there's also a reason why they don't do it is because they, yeah. they don't want to, you know, zap away all your control over your computer for a single program. Yes. So. Now, so just... In Riot's defense, here's a quote from one of their um, like representatives for all of us laymen. Uh, they um, describe the rootkit as, I think of it as a very a specialized antivirus that only protects Valorant. It's like, okay. And this is, again, their Vanguard system. If you play League of Legends, you're, like very, you're um, very familiar with this. They say that all of Vanguard has been audited for security weaknesses by external audit firms as well as our internal security team yada 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 with emphasis on that kernel component okay and that kernel component that's the word that i learned it gives kernel uh, privileges which is like the very root that's like if someone you know like has their hands on your throat right it's like at the very core like of your pc personally i think um i th i think this was very like very misleading. I think they knew people would be like up in arms about this when they had their big release, when they had their big PR thing. They didn't uh, mention this, and I think, and I think the reality is, ninety percent of people who install Valorant will never read this article. They will never even uh, understand why this is an issue. So all they are going to know is that there is less cheaters in Valorant than there is in other games, and that is going to become. The narrative so i think to kind of end the topic it really seems to me like an ends uh, justifies the means type thing right because yes the means is i think there's going to be a lot less hackers in valorant but i've actually even read that there's already hackers i've already read that there's so there might be less hackers read, but yeah. there's still going to be hackers so yes. and there's still ways in which you can cheat so you know i know that fps games are like i'm notoriously hard to stop that um, simply because, you know, there's, uh, you know, aimbots and vision and there's just, there's so like, it's different than something like an MMO or like a, a MOBA or like a fighting game, you know, like it, it's very, very different. I actually, I actually, I'm like, remember there was a very popular Street Fighter series and this is a bit of a tangent, but I promise it all comes back full circle. There is a Street Fighter series in which this guy would program a bot to essentially play um, Street Fighter matches. But the thing is, like, with the press of a button, it would execute, like, the hardest combos to do in the game. So it became this extremely hard, like, thing to beat because it would play extremely um, defensively, and the moment it would touch you, you get max damage combos, right? But even then, people were beating it. Even then, you know, like, pro players were beating it. So it's like... It's so much harder to cheat in those type of games because it's like, all right, even if you do do max damage, I'll, st I'll still be able to beat you. But in like FPS games, if you have aimbot, it's just a headshot. You're dead. There's nothing you can do. If there's someone who has the ability to, with the press of a button, find where your head is and then have their, or, you know, there's really nothing you can do. So I think that's why cheating has always been more important in FPS games. And, you know, I think only a uh, time will tell. It's like first foray into uh, the genre too, so yeah. I think they're just kind of, you know, putting the hammer down, maybe yeah. a little bit more than they they should be. Uh, yeah. They just want to be safe about it, I guess. So, well, you know, we'll update you on this. Uh, as someone who, admittedly, is not a programmer or is not a hacker, um, and who has someone who has been doxed by E3, and they said that their security was great. They said that. Oh, it's super, super safe. I've gotten a little uh, paranoid about these big companies saying that my data is safe because, you know, like routinely it's not. So you think, uh, you think Riot has all of our login information on like an Excel sheet that, I, can, <laughs> that has like Google share? Open I know, or right? Oh, my God. Laughable. So Eric is actually mentioning to how bad E3 security was. 
it was literally that. And not only was this Google Doc just like available, you could find it just by typing in a URL, like on the E3 site, you just type in a certain URL and there's my, my address. There's your boy's address and my phone number and my email. Insane. So uh, yeah, that's all for Valorant um, uh, cheaters. Um, yeah, I think uh, cheating will always be something that happens in esports. And to be honest, as esports become more and more lucrative, we won't see the last of it. Uh, there's been all sorts of uh, cheating allegations amongst teams just throwing matches and fixing matches. So, you know, hey, maybe even if Valorant does, you know, like lock it up in the technical sort, there's always the throws and there's always, you know, that's hard. So yeah. moving on. I mean, yes. It, you see cheating in, in everything, yep. you know, regardless of if it's online or in person, whether it's an eSport or a traditional sport, I mean, it's just going to happen. So, yeah. Uh. I don't know. So, uh, yeah, moving you want to move on? Back, to, uh... So there's more Riot news. And there this is. is actually, I think, pretty exciting. So this is um, the roadmap. This is, uh, so this not a gamer.net um, article that we're saying says leak, Riot's release. But this isn't a leak. This is like something that like Riot like openly shares, just by the way. Yeah. I, I first saw a Riot employee on LinkedIn share this. So it's like, yeah, this isn't a leak. So come on, not. A game so I saw the headline. I was like, I don't know. I feel like most of this information is already out there. I it, mean, I was. Yeah, right? I, was just, I just glanced at this image the first time. It's like, oh, they have like concrete dates for all these titles, but they're all like, yeah, they're just announced. Like, you know. Yeah. People, it's coming eventually. So I mean, the only thing that really, you know, strikes me as different is the League of Legends World Rift is apparently coming out sometime this year. So yeah, wild. Sorry. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, I think um, um, part of why I wanted to talk about this is this really, really, like, underlines how much Riot is, like, lapping a blizzard. Like, if this was a race, Riot is not only ahead by two laps, but they're waving at the crowd while, while making fun of blizzard. Like, all, like, um, the fact that they're... I'm releasing so many things and there's such a wide a variety. You have this esports manager, which by the way, sounds hilariously fun. It's like a weird like resource management game. If you've ever played these type of games, I actually have really fun. I forgot the name of it, but there is this like boxing like manager game I used to play when I was a kid and you could like raise this boxer and you'd have to like manage him and you'd have to plan his like when his fight dates are. So I had tons of uh, uh, fun with that and i feel like if if you're into those resource management type games you're probably gonna have a lot of fun playing law esports manager like you can just pretend yeah, those uh, those uh soccer management games have like hundreds of thousands of players still yeah yeah like, it's just a pitch that you kind of want to scratch you know if you want to, if you don't want to play like the actual sports game of it and you want to be more of the the sim creator behind the scenes yeah like, and you yeah. know and you know i, I think that so part of why I think this is important in terms of like esports industry stuff is I think Riot has seen the biggest advantage that Blizzard has always had, right? And that big advantage is they have this core um, audience that is absolutely in love with their IP, right? This is a core audience who loves grunts and orcs and they love night elves and they love the world of Warcraft universe. They love Starcraft. So it almost doesn't matter what blizzard put out because there's that core audience that will always buy it and will always uh, love it and i feel as if this is exactly what we're seeing here uh you have this core league of legends fan base right and it started with team fight tactics but now it um, is expanding with legends of Ruterra. it is expanding with project l a fighting game by the way i cannot wait i don't know a single league of legends a character i think i know timo I know Jinx. I know there's a guy who dunks on people, yeah. right? So again, I'm a fake esports boy. Um, League of Legends have just never been my thing, but I'm excited to dive into this world through a genre I love. I'm excited to try their tabletop game, right? I'm excited to try their three, uh, their top-down a uh, Diablo-esque um, RPG game, right? So I'm excited to um, dive into this through like more genres. Yeah. Eric. I mean, that's what they're banking on. Yeah. I mean, just putting out games in every genre you could think of. Uh, they're really banking on you to, you know, 
see these characters, uh, learn to like these characters, familiarize yourself mm -hmm. with these characters, and then be like, oh, you know, I love this character. Let's check out the other games that, you know, have them in. So, uh, Eric, what games are you most, in like, what genre are you most interested in? You know, because I'm pretty I'll sure you're not a... i try out the fighting game. Yeah. I know I'm not, like, a huge fighting game head or anything, but uh, I really liked what the... Um, what was that game that they're basically basing this off of, off of Rising Thunder? Is that yes, the game? yes, Rising Thunder. Rising and it basically Thunder had fantastic. like Super Smash Brothers inputs with uh, all your yep. specials on like cooldowns and stuff. Yes, kinda, that kind of seems like more more my speed. Uh, so when it have comes you to ever game. have you ever played um, Grand Blue, a fantasy? That's the yeah, yeah yeah. So it's the same it's the same style, and I personally it was. It, it's funny. I was actually just having a conversation with my friend about this. Um, he asked me a very loaded a question. He was like, Nick, this was um, via text. He was like, Nick, uh, what would you say is the most popular fighting game of all time? Right. And I'm like, well, OK. I was kind of like doing the math in my head. Eh, this, this. It's probably got to be Street Fighter 2. Right. Like Street Fighter 2. There's more arcade cabinets that are still like operational of Street Fighter 2 than like any other game simply because of how massive it was in the 90s. Almost everyone who loves fighting games has either gotten their start in Street Fighter 2 or at least, you know, like people my age, right? And then he started asking, okay, so what is the difference between Street Fighter 2 controls and Super Smash Bros. controls? He says, which one is like, is like the best? And do you think that like Mortal Kombat controls? Like he was just asking me all of these questions about, because he's trying to work on... A game design so he's asked me like which do you think is the most successful and why and i think this directly ties into why we see such success uh with dragon ball z fighters we've seen a rising success with grand blue and i predict that project l is going to be what world of warcraft did to mmos to the fighting yeah. game a genre there is going to be an entire group of of pc gamers who have never thought they could play a fighting game because they don't know how to do a shoryuken they don't know how to do a hadouken they don't know how to do all those inputs they play smash brothers casually because every gamer plays smash brothers casually but the reason every gamer plays smash brothers casually is because of that con of, of that control scheme up b down b left b and b right that's what's that's what you're going to be able to do in Project L. So I absolutely can't wait. Eric, I know you're a smasher of yourself. Have you have you dabbled in any other fighting games, or is Smash really your a main one? Dragon Ball Fighters. Uh, I I was convinced for the longest time that was going to be the one, the one that I would put like all of my time into. Yeah. Um, I mean, aside from just being a big Dragon Ball Z fan. Uh, I Let thought me guess. what they chose to do with that game uh, made it super accessible. Yeah. You know, uh, it's a thing where you can either just kind of mash the button for a weak combo, or you can put in all the directionals and time it out and get you know more damage off of it. Yeah, um, it was cool. I was go. I did the whole story mode. I was going into training modes and doing that. And it's just as soon as I went online, I was just getting bodied. Yeah, and bodied, and bodied. I mean, and, that'll uh, do it. That'll happen to everyone. Yeah, and even playing against uh, my friends that played like um, Guilty Gear and all those games, I was I was just not keeping up. So um, movement, I yeah, guarantee was... your movement wasn't there. I bet your combo game was probably yeah. good, but it's the movement that separates. It's just like when you spend so much time in training with like these these uh, characters that you just have stand there or like jump <laughs> up or like yeah. throw out punch every so often you get into this rhythm where you're like oh this this combo is ridiculous i can just yeah. like do this every time but then as soon as you like as soon as the pressure's like, on slightly out of like your range or something the whole thing is like completely yeah. thrown out of whack so so uh, th this yeah. is a friendly uh a friendly psa for anyone who wants to get good at fighting games just play against the computer the ai have gotten so good in fighting games that I guarantee if you ramp up the difficulty at the hardest, you're going to get stomped, but you're going to learn a lot. If you can beat, like, that should be your test. Can you beat the AI at the very, very hardest difficulty? If not, you probably should stay away from online because you're going to get yeah. destroyed. But that being said, there's also things I'm also, I'm excited about other than, other than 
the fighting game. For one, they're having this like cinematic, this movie called Arcane. I don't know like if this is a feature length movie. I just saw the like trailer for it and I was super hyped. Like, uh, you know, I think a lot cool. of, I think a lot of gamers have been saying like one of the most common things every time there's this amazing, a uh, cinematic, be it a World of Warcraft or Halo or Doom, right? Some of these really, really iconic cinematics that just make everyone says, man, you know how cool it would be if there was an entire movie that looked like this? Or you know how cool it would be if there was an entire, right? I think that's what Arcane is going to be. It's it's going to be like a video game world that I think really, really nails the like aesthetic and really, really looks beautiful. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised uh, Blizzard hasn't jumped on on that already. With, well, I who mean, knows? The, Maybe I mean, they are. They had that World of Warcraft movie or something, but Which, uh, okay, I'm I, talking about like those Overwatch cinematics, just like you know, make an hour long special or like hour and a half. It doesn't will, have to come out in theaters or something. I uh, will, I will defend the World of Warcraft movie until I die, because not only was the movie like, listen, if you love WoW, and are you really trying to say you didn't have fun to watch that movie? I've had, I've had this debate with so many salty salty blizzard fans who were like 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 what were you expecting it's a movie they were like expecting it to be this grand fantasy where every single one of their favorite characters like come on man it's a movie i think it did great made tons of money in china but you know yeah well yeah it could could have been cool by the way speaking of things that are beautiful and cool the final fantasy 7 remake can we please have some time to talk about this game yeah sure so Um, um here have you played have you played any of it uh let me see if i can put up there so (laughs) i have actually let me just get up an image so i can just show you guys how beautiful this oh look at this beautiful man cloud wow the hollywood the anime boy yeah the hollywood um, reporter is writing about final fantasy 7 that's how so i have watched this game now twice full playthroughs really yes (laughs) i am this game is absolute a beautiful so i guess i love a speed running i'm a huge fan of like speed running the final fantasy games the first time i watched it i watched my favorite a speed runner shout out to caleb hart the guys of final fantasy 7 speed run god like he is speed, he has been speed running final fantasy 7 the original forever so i watched him just play through the whole thing blind it was like you know 30 hours of twitch vods that was just con- constant autoplay as i wrote and worked beautiful game i feel as if i've like played it through watching him, right? So amazing. The cinematics, everything, absolutely gorgeous. And I can't believe this is just the first one. I think that this game has officially set the bar for every single remake, for every single remaster. And I don't know, Eric, have you had a chance to see it? Have you ever had a chance to see this game? Yeah, I'm like two chapters in. Uh, yeah, it, it's good. I'm I'm digging it a lot. Uh, so what shows- mode do you play on? I didn't play. I'm not playing on classic, but I'm kind of tempted to uh, do that. Yeah. Or at least try it out. Uh, I think my main problems with combat right now are not being able to time out like dodging and guarding in time. Like yeah. I just, I'm not in the rhythm yet uh, where I'm at right now. Too. Or, or I'm just like buddy mashing too much where it's like putting in too much commands that stack on top of each other yeah, to a yeah. point when I go to dodge or, or uh, block, it's just not reading it in time or I don't know what it is, but I got to figure it out. But um, see, yeah, it's, it's cool. Yeah. And I just think that like a part of me wants to immediately compare this to the Warcraft three on reforged uh, remaster. That mm-hmm. was quite literally one of the worst games released in the year. Which is incredible because it's 2020 and I'm talking uh, about Blizzard, like releasing possibly one of the worst games of the year. That just doesn't happen, right? Since when did Blizzard get into the business of, you know, like releasing games that were literally broken on release? But that was a remake. And I think, like, there was a point in which I was a little cynical about the Final Fantasy VII a remake. I think it was when I saw there was merchandise in gas stations and when I saw that, like, Butterfinger was doing this promotion in which you, like, buy. A Butterfingers and you get in-game you know rewards like, yeah. I was like oh okay this is just a huge cash grab I'm like this is just another cash grab remake in which these uh, studios play on our nostalgia and love for the IP but no man I, I I mean 
I don't want to be a fanboy, but I think Final Fantasy VII is a work of art, man. Like, like this is, I would compare Final Fantasy VII, a remake to like the golden age of gaming, that like '90s era in which we had these RPGs that people were like, yeah, this is art. Everything was beautifully hand uh, um, hand drawn sprites. I mean, just like visually, the game's gorgeous. So if you haven't had a chance to take a look, I'm just. I'm a gog over this game. I literally keep watching people play this game, and it's just beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna give uh, put some more time into it this weekend or something. Uh, I've just been playing Persona Five Royal. I just can't stop. It's like a drug. So speaking uh, of a drug, oh my god, how am I going to somehow relate this to Cooking Mama? Speaking of a drug, things are getting. Uh, Things are getting legal or illegal. Okay, there you go. Bam. The like legality of certain drugs and Cookie Mama. Eric, I would love for you to kind of um, lead on, lead us on this. Apparently, the owners of the Cooking Mama um, IP are pursuing legal um, action against a developer called Cookstar. Eric, I really want to hear this this piece. Yeah, this whole. This whole thing's a real trip, uh, for sure. Uh, definitely like one of the the messiest stories to come out this year. Uh, basically, like the um, owners of the Cookie Mama franchise uh-huh. licensed it uh, to this like Australian company or something yeah. that I don't really done like shitty mobile games and like ports and stuff. Yeah. So, uh, and I didn't know this about uh, Cookie Mama before I did a little bit more research. But I mean, Cookie Mama has sold like over twenty million. Uh, copies across its entire franchise or it's something. It's a popular uh, game, man. It's very, it, it, very popular. You know, it's got its audience. Yep. So it's, <laughs> I mean, so just kind of throwing this to uh, whoever and just kind of telling them what to do with it is kind of weird enough. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it just kind of spiraled into this whole thing with the uh, the owners of the IP were not happy oh with uh, what the devs were, were putting together. Uh, and they gave them all these notes, and it was part of their contract that they basically had to do whatever whatever yeah. they said. Yeah. And then uh, before they even knew it, the game was out on like Switch uh, eShop, and it was you you could find it in like Targets and stuff here and there. Uh, and so, is yeah, this was- correct? Um, and please correct me if I'm wrong. It says here that the developers, in an attempt to attract sponsors mentioned putting um, Cooking Mama on the blockchain yeah. and alluded to crypto a currency. And yeah, so that's just another another little swerve in this story where uh, it was basically this document that got leaked where it was just like this big hoity-toity like wording that like didn't mean anything. But, you know, once uh, the game was pulled from, from stores for obvious reasons now, uh, there was a lot of speculation uh, so it was basically like this document that said like, oh yeah, we're really looking into putting Cookie Mama on the blockchain, and and, fa- <laughs> it was the thing. and fans started to speculate that the game was being used to mine cryptocurrency, and that's why yeah. your Switch started to overheat every time you played it. Switch, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, <laughs> it was a whole thing. What are the actual odds that that's true? Like, what? <laughs> gosh. That is absolutely insane. Uh, Nintendo's like quality, uh, quality test, but yeah, apparently um, it was just something that they had on the table. They had an idea of uh, people would exchange, like, in-game items through the blockchain. Wow. We, I, it's just like people that don't know what cryptocurrency is or how the blockchain. So it's uh, just works. a rumor. It's 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 just a rumor. You don't think it's true? It's just something that the the owner of the company put in to like trigger sponsors, you know. Wow, like, oh, yeah. cryptocurrency that's so hot right now. It's like yeah. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, Inven Global is just releasing now our new crypto. It's called <laughs> Inven Bucks. Uh, mm-hmm. Every time you read one of our articles, it slowly mines cryptocurrency <laughs> for both you and us. So yeah, check out InvenGlobal.com. Just kidding. By the way. Yeah. Um, have you ever played Overcooked? We're talking about like cooking games. Yeah. I love Overcooked, yeah. right? Overcooked. Yeah, it's a good game. I think Overcooked is run. I think I'm um, Cooking Mama. I walked, so Overcooked could run. You know what I mean? My cryptocurrency on my on my computer any day. Absolutely. <laughs> if you can um, do it on my PS4, please go, go for it. 
Oh gosh, <laughs> this quarantine has got me playing a lot of games that I haven't played in a very, very long time. Um, yeah. Just recently, I've been playing a lot of Super Metroid. And um, by the way, the podcast is ending, so now I just get to talk about my favorite games, right? Um, Super Metroid. I just want to let it, man, that game is so just gorgeous. I'm playing this game. The the music, the the sound effects, everything. Have you this? If you have it, or if you haven't, just do a YouTube search for just look up a, a Super Metroid and just watch the opening scene. I feel as if the fact that they were doing this back in what like 1994, compl- like who was making a game this like cinematic? It's like the tone. The atmosphere, it's so good. Have you ever played Super Metroid? I started it up, but I never actually finished it. You don't have um you don't have a 3DS or anything, right? No, I have a I have a SNES Mini which I well actually it's funny. All of all of my consoles are trapped back home in Arizona. Yeah. Horrible horrible timing. I um I visited home and I uh I gave them to all of my nephews and nieces so um, you know, they could play. And then the quarantine happened, and now I'm stuck in my house, and I have no video games. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the only Metroid games that i played are all three of the Metroid Prime games, which were... Which oh, were very great. fun. Very fun, uh, yeah. And Samus Returns on the 3DS, which is a remake of uh, the second Metroid game, yep. I think. Yep. I, uh, which is good. They added, I've, like, the counter system in and stuff, and all this new stuff. And I've also cool. loved... The Metroid Fusion games; those are amazing games for the DS. Anyways, Eric, what games are you going to play next week? What are you, as a gamer, you can take off your business manager hat. What are you going to be doing next week in terms of gaming? Uh, Persona Five Royal, probably. Uh, I just found out that if you play darts, you can increase your uh, baton passes with party members, and oh. it is like on my fucking mind. Really. Let me tell you. Yeah, I, it's crazy. I, I don't know what a baton pass is, <laughs> yeah. but it sounds great. It's cool. You play uh, darts with your cat if you want to. Very cool. You got your cat in a bag and throws darts. Um, um, yeah, what about honestly, you? Honestly, I've been having a lot of fun playing Hearthstone uh, Battlegrounds, only because it's the Hearthstone uh, Battlegrounds is the ultimate game to play when you're watching something on Netflix. It's the ultimate game. I've been yeah. watching uh, a Castlevania, the Netflix series, um, all over again. Yeah. Because... Okay. There is a new season that came out. I haven't watched it yet, so I figured in order to watch the new season, I would just rewatch it. And I'm just sitting there playing Battlegrounds, and I, dude, I am good at Battlegrounds. Let me tell you, your boy gets first often. So I've been playing a lot of Hearthstone Battlegrounds and watching Castlevania. So that's fun. And yeah, also- I went out on uh, auto chess on like a pretty hot streak. I was like, to a point where I was like, never going to do that again. Where yes. I, I came in, I came in first like three times after not playing for like three months or something i was like yeah I'm so just you know speaking of auto chess this is a a last minute uh, shout out you know a drodo a studios yeah so not many people know this but the original creators of the auto battle a genre from auto chess was just a mod for dota 2 they're like back in the game i just recently got a press release from them and they're like hey listen we've been radio silent for like a while but Drodo's back. The original um, Auto Chess is back. They're like planning new content, um, new patches. So hey, man, I'm um, good on you. Yeah. Keep fighting, Drodo yeah. Studios. I I tried uh, all those uh, Auto Auto Chesses uh, from Dota yeah. uh, Underlords to uh, Team Fight Tactics, and I, I don't know. I don't know if it was like because it was the first one that I played, but Auto Chess was like the one that I it's, wanted yeah. to, to put my time into. So. Yeah. So I'm going to do a shameless plug. Uh, you can check out and you can see on the screen here. I have been recording eSports lectures every Tuesday. So I know that you come to this podcast because you love to hear me talk. Well, guess what? You can literally hear me talk even more. I have lectured how to become an eSports a journalist. I've lectured about the difference between good eSports content and bad eSports content. And I believe the other lecture I gave was about... What was it? Oh yes, it was about creating an um, authentic, like, a uh, presence 
as an esports content creator. So if you've ever wanted to start your own stuff, if you've ever wanted to start your own content, please, please, please give these things a um, listen. You can also check out other um, episodes of our podcast on our Inven Global YouTube channel. And if you really want to go on a time warp, you can listen on our SoundCloud and listen to podcast episodes before the world went in lockdown. It's crazy. Me and Eric are like talking about plans for like the weekend and we're like, yo, see you later because we were going to see each other later. Now it's like, yeah, it, it's crazy. Oh, so yeah. I know, right? Man, I used to go to meetings. I used to drive and go to meetings. But I was thinking about that today. I was like, man times i mean i don't miss it i don't miss traffic <laughs> i will say that oh okay last thing i have noticed an influx of street racers there are street racers in um la there is some serious fast and the furious stuff going on and yeah. it's it makes sense all the streets no. are empty especially yeah. at night and i hear these guys vroom vrooming constantly so <laughs> i mean shout outs to fast and the furious shout out to Tokyo Drift, you know, it's cool. cool. I hope someone makes a movie about it one day, right? Uh. <laughs> oh my God, Eric, quick, mm -hmm. give me a Fast and the Furious uh, title, but somehow involve um, COVID-19, you know, like Fast, you know, like Fast and the Furious, a uh, colon, what would the movie be? Uh, it's gotta be the fifth, cause COVID, you got yeah, that oh, Okay. Uh, <laughs> COVID. <laughs> That's so good. Weird. That's way too much to come okay. up with on the spot. Let me try. I'll uh, make it. To the, I'll workshop it and I'll make it the title of this. Podcast. Workshop it. Workshop it. Wait. Fast and the Furious. Uh, quarantine for speed. Need for speed. No. No. Teen for speed. Cor mm -hmm. Uh. Uh. Fast and the no. Furious. Corolla, Cor isn't Corolla a type of car? God, I'm so bad. I'm yeah. so so. On behalf of Inven Global, I would like to apologize for the last two minutes of this podcast. It has been an absolute train wreck. But this concludes episode 12 of the Inven Global Cast. I want to thank you all for listening, or if you're watching on our live stream, you can check out all of our content on InvenGlobal.com. You can follow Eric at Winko Stainless uh, on twitter please tweet to him follow him tweet to him force him <laughs> to use social media i beg of you and you can follow me at nick terrazio 3rd um please like my tweets because no one does uh that has been the Invin global cast uh tune in next wednesday for the best fast and the furious covid19 movie title ever we are going to workshop it and i promise you mm. next week we're going to deliver it's going to be huge so check it out. We're locked in now. We have to do it. So thank you guys <laughs> for listening, and I'll see you next podcast. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Take care.